Welcome to Middlesex Moments, coming to you from Middlesex Community College in Middletown. I'm Steve Minkler, the college CEO. And most days when I introduce Middlesex Moments, I say we are coming from the Center for New Media. But as you may be able to see, if you're watching us on YouTube, I'm coming to you from home, as is my guest, Rich Linosi, who's professor and director of the Center for New Media. Thank you for joining me today, Rich. Hi, Steve. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So let's talk a little bit about the Center for New Media. How are things going so far this semester in a COVID environment? Are you? I know we've worked with some of your students uh, in the studio. How, how, how are classes running uh, with this COVID situation going on? Well, as you know, 90 plus percent of our classes in our department are um, online, uh, either hybrid, some form of hi- totally online or some form of hybrid. It's just uh, two classes right now. Uh, that we have um, that are completely in the studio because they have to be a studio class. It's a TV studio production, which is a makeup class, broadcast journalism, um, an electronic music recording class, and a uh, uh, makeup class in digital cinematography. So, and with that comes all the prohibitions of standing <laughs> equidistant from each other and wearing masks and uh, you know, following guidelines and behavior, uh, which is uh, very hard in a studio situation when things are, are, don't always go right and people have to jump in and really work together to accomplish something. So, so it's hard. And then I, I'm teaching a, a digital video production class, which is uh, student's choice. If students have a video camera and they have Adobe uh, Premiere software, they can watch me at home uh, broadcasting from the classroom, or uh, they can be in the classroom if they don't. And that's running about 50 50. Okay. So. Now, in some of the classes that you uh, are teaching this semester, in order to maintain that social distance, did you have to break the students into smaller groups or pods so that they could stay apart from one another in a studio? Y- yes, we had to limit actually their movements um, into blocks. And so, you know, five students were in, the, uh, for example, our Middlesex Moment broadcast the other day, and they have to be seven feet away from you, seven feet away from the guests, seven feet away from each other mm-hmm. in squares. Yeah, you know, we have it marked on the floor and the same in our control room. Uh, they're in smaller groups. Normally we would have, I don't know, we probably have 10 in each room, uh, but we had like, uh, six and five plus uh, you and the guests, so seven. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so you know, we, everything is in, is in smaller groups. Um, in certain cases, they're not in groups at all. They're having to work independently for logistical reasons. So, I mean, I gotta, I gotta say it, it's hard to do it with a cohort program where you've got a program where everybody is taking the same classes and working together collaboratively. They know all their strengths. They know the weaknesses of everybody in the class and they can all come together and uh, do the best production they possibly can. Right. And uh, it, it makes it hard to form a cohort in this environment with our freshmen and makes it hard to continue that uh, momentum uh, with the senior students. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it, it's, it's challenging, but I, do, I have to say a couple things, and this is a compliment to you and Kim and Sarah and Sherelle and the rest of the administration is first, we feel incredibly safe. That is, I mean, it's, it's at times a ghost town down there and we're the only ones in the building, um, which is good because we're not, we don't accidentally run into other people we don't know uh, and all. It's very limited, you know, we're limited at who can have access to the building. And also the students are incredibly respectful, as you've seen, of, of each other and of faculty and uh, administration. Uh, they understand the rules and they're playing by them. Um, and not, I have not heard one complaint. I mean, if it were, if it were me and I were a student, <laughs> I, I might feel kind of gypped. Right, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, and not being able to interact with my friends, which is, you know, we see that going on at the, uh, some of the four-year schools where they're just throwing caution to the wind. Uh, but no, our students are incredibly respectful. So yeah. I'm, uh, I'm very happy with their response. That's great and the to hear. response of our administration in really protecting us and keeping us safe. I appreciate that. Thank you, Rich. And more with my conversation with professor and director of the Center for New Media, Rich Linosi, after this short break. You're listening to Middlesex Moments from Middlesex Community College.
Welcome back to Middlesex Moments, coming to you from Middlesex Community College. I'm Steve Minkler, the college CEO, and I've been having a conversation with Rich Linosi, who is professor and director of the Center for New Media, and he's also a food blogger. But kind of before we get to that, I just wanted to wrap up a couple things that we were talking about before the break with how you're running classes this semester, Rich. And I know in this field of media production, there's a lot of pretty intensive software that students have to use. And, and this semester with COVID happening, are students able to access labs or the software that they need to be successful in these courses? Yes, uh, they are. Um, it, our loan pool is open. Uh, it has restrictions, uh, time restrictions when they come pick up and drop things off, as well as quarantine restrictions when they come when the equipment comes back, it has to go into a room. We don't touch it. Our staff doesn't touch it. The students bring it into a room, put it on a table, and it sits for 48 to 72 hours to uh, naturally disinfect. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so, so you know, access to the studios there, um, it's very limited, though. I gave my first uh, tour the other day. Usually I give like two tours a day sometimes mm -hmm. during the week. Uh, I probably do five... I don't know, four to 10 tours a week for the Center for New Media, whether it's new students or high schools or businesses or uh, people in our, our system or whatever. So uh, so it's it's definitely mellow, but operations are taking place. Uh, functions have shifted. We're doing a lot more uh, production for internal clients uh, because they need consulting. Uh, they need video production to... Uh, to uh, send out to students about processes like, you know, how do you access library materials in an online environment? Uh, for example, we did a video on that. Uh, we, we did 16 videos, I think we're up to now, mm -hmm. on uh, new student orientation, little modules. Um, because we normally we do student orientation, it's a, it's a whole or half day, depending on uh, where people jump in and uh, we've had to take up that slack and because uh, we couldn't have people on campus. So um, right. we developed a, a new student orientation uh, series of modules. Yeah, so it's really a new way of uh, working and, and learning and teaching in this environment. So I, I applaud you and I applaud your students for really persevering and doing the best you can. But it's also a new way of using media to do a lot of these things that we kind of took for granted as face-to-face -face interactions on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, not even, not even real. We weren't allowed to interview people for four yeah. months. So we purchased animation software. Either we got stuff from, <laughs> we either uh, picked video clips from uh, thousands of hours, Dan, Dan O'Sara tells me, of stock footage that he had, or uh, we purchased an animation software called Powtoons uh, that... Uh, takes the place of real people. Mm -hmm. um, you probably, many people who've done training videos this uh, summer have probably seen that. So, so Rich, you and I have known each other longer than we're going to want to admit to, yeah. <laughs> to an audience. <laughs> and we've both worked in the media field for a very long time. So we've seen a lot of changes that have occurred uh, over our years in this business. But um, you kind of took it to a new level by combining uh, some your personal interest in cooking and culture to start a food blog and talk a little more about what you've been doing with this blog and, and what you try to feature. Well, you know, I get, I get, um, there are lots of cooking, uh, website websites out there. Uh, they're all almost all recipe focused. And if you're Italian, grandma never cooked with a recipe. We don't have her recipes. <laughs> you know, they, they died with her. Um, but what we do have her techniques. And that is the secret to, um, it's not just Italian, but many immigrant cooking, is that, uh, that they brought from their home country the techniques. They couldn't even bring the ingredients because mm -hmm. things like broccoli didn't exist in the United States until 1930 when some Italian brought it over and bought farmland in Cal California. So they didn't even have the same ingredients. So they had to take their techniques, take the ingredients here that are in the United States and make a whole new cuisine out of it. So what I'm trying to do with my blog is focus on, on the techniques. Um, because once you know the techniques, you can, you can make anything. Uh, an example, um, I was, 
uh, a friend of mine asked me about the blog yesterday. I said, well, go back to the very first one. And I explain kind of the philosophy. And uh, there's a very simple Italian dish called uh, uh, agliulio. It's just oil and garlic mm-hmm. with pasta. But take that oil and garlic with pasta, add white wine, throw more garlic in and some butter and some shrimp and you have scampi. Mm-hmm. So the technique develops into the recipe, right. not the other way around. Most of the time you read a recipe and you learn the technique while you're doing it. Um, it kind of works in an opposite direction. So that's what I focus on, less on recipes. I use them as examples, but uh, mostly it's about the technique to get from point A to point B with whatever area of ingredients you're trying to deal with, whether it's meats or seafood or um, salamis or you know whatever it happens to be. Right. right, so you use those techniques really as building blocks to say, okay, remember when we learned this in blog number 23, whatever that technique is named, now we're going to add to that to bring in some new ingredients and to try something uh, completely different. But but you've already, you're building on that foundation of things that you've already taught the person in right. the blog. Right, and I talk yeah. a lot about the history. Yep. Um, I went and I got my, I don't know if you've done it, but uh, I got went to Ancestry.com yep. and I got my, my uh, blo- you know, my uh, test done in my DNA. And I'm not 100% Italian at all. I've got some Turkish, some Greek, some Albanian, you know, I'm only about 70% Italian, which, you know, my uh, grandparents, you know, they were 100%, you know, they were 100% because they came from Italy, but really their blood didn't, Uh, you know, it was mixed through various wars and invasions and explorations and all kinds of things. So, Mm -hmm. Um, that occurred through history. So I'm actually kind of proud of that because it, it kind of reflects the, the history of, of the culture and its, its influence throughout the world, as well as the influence of other cultures. I mean, much of Italian cooking is based on, on Middle, e- Middle Eastern cooking. I'm doing one on meatballs <laughs> this week. Yeah. And the uh, meatballs uh, came from, uh, the, from Persia, um, still made today. I actually had one a few weeks ago um, called Kafka is the name of it. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, ground lamb that formed into a ball with spices and stuck on a skewer and grilled. Mm-hmm. And that was the first meatball. And it made its way to Italy and they used their ingredients and their techniques to make it theirs. So right. it's a, uh, it's an interesting culture, this kind of blend. Right. You also talk a lot about the, the, the cultural traditions that go along with it. I know you, you blog frequently around uh, many of the religious observances and holidays in Italian culture, Christian culture, and how those tie together with, uh, again, kind of hearkening back to uh, what your, your ancestors would have done in Italy. And maybe talk a, a little more about that as well. Well, it's, it, they, I mean, when I was a kid, it's not so much now. We, we had a religious holiday like every couple of weeks we had. <laughs> we had All Saints Day and then All, all Souls Day. And they were like within two weeks of each other. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of like Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, you know, very mm-hmm. close together. And the same thing, when you got to Lent, it was, you got Ash Wednesday, you have the Festival of St. This and St. That. And uh, St. Joseph is one um, because there's something called a Zeppoli, the Italian version of a very sweet big donut. Uh, that's made and kids always look out for it because it's got cream inside and gets all over your face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there are foods that are attached. Christmas Eve, uh, the um, uh, Seven Fishes Festival, which is not, and this is the thing, is that that is not an Italian tradition. If you went to Italy and you said the Feast of the Seven Fishes, they have no idea what you're talking about. It's an <laughs> Italian-American thing. Okay. To celebrate the abundance of... of uh, food in America, but also uh, uh, giving praise to the seafaring culture that they came from. And it, and it didn't actually become a thing until the 19, late 1960s, early 70s. Okay. So uh, when you do that, you also talk about uh, the food that you make, maybe pairing things with wine or other things to drink, but then also sort of the cultural significance of all of this as well, which is great. Now, when, when you were, um, well, I don't know, when you were growing up or even as an adult, did you kind of watch your, your mother, grandmother's father or whatever with the cooking in the house? And, and how did you become more acclimated to cooking it yourself? It's one thing to learn these techniques, but then you actually have to practice it and do it. Well, it's funny. My mother was an, a strictly American cook. She <laughs> made meatloaf, and then for dessert, you'd have that 
What, what was that thing they used to eat, Steve? It was Jello with the marshmallows in. Oh yeah, yeah. I, right. I'm trying to remember the name of yeah. it. Yeah. She'd make those kind of things. Whereas my grandmother cooked old school. I mean, she uh -huh. didn't pasta was made homemade, which I make my own pasta uh, now. I have her her pasta maker. I should have brought it in. I could have, yeah. could have held it up. <laughs> um, and uh, I watched her. Um, she lived with us for a while, and uh, I would go over there on weekends and spend weekends with her, and then my uh, paternal grandfather at his house and he did the same thing he he cooked everything from scratch and I was able to watch both of them and just kind of suck it in I you know they'd explain a little bit to me but you know they would just cook and I'd just be sitting there talking to them mm -hmm. but you know you watch someone make manicotti for the 23rd time it's not rocket science right so you watch it and then you go oh I can I can do that it's not that bad you know maybe I can't do it as well as the, as they did but you know I tried and usually I can pull it off. So yeah. awesome. Well, Rich, time for a quick break. And when we come back after the break, more of my conversation with Rich Linosi, who's professor and director of the Center for New Media at Middlesex Community College and a food blogger. You're listening to Middlesex Moments from Middlesex Community College. Feel like the pandemic put your life on hold? In times of uncertainty, Middlesex Community College is your way forward. With several degree, transfer, and career path options, your goals are not on hold. Stay close to home. Save thousands on tuition. Discover a classroom as unique as you. At MXCC, you'll receive a high quality and affordable education with flexible scheduling. Find the perfect path at Middlesex. MXCC is your way forward. Register now. Welcome back to Middlesex Moments from Middlesex Community College in Middletown. I'm Steve Minkler, the college CEO, and continuing my conversation with Rich Lanosi, who is professor and director of the Center for New Media at Middlesex Community College and a food blogger. So we've been talking all things food in our last segment. And Rich, what are some of your favorite dishes that you've uh, offered to the readers of your blog? Well, anything with fresh pasta. I just think fresh pasta compared to any kind of pasta you can uh, buy in a store, uh, whether dried or fresh, you know, out of the, you know, freezer case or whatever, um, it's just night and day. There's no comparison. And it's very easy to do. Even if you don't have a machine, you can do it by hand uh, with a rolling pin. It just takes a little bit of muscle, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's the easiest recipe, a couple of, a couple of eggs and a couple of cups of uh, flour. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times my favorite recipes stem off of that. Um, I, I'm particularly intrigued by simple recipes that you can't get in a restaurant because they're too simple. Okay. You know, they take a certain amount, a few ingredients and care. Uh, one of those is um, uh, spaghetti with clams, uh, linguine con vongole, mm -hmm. um, and using fresh, good fresh clams, using a nice dry white wine, um, and just letting the clams open spit out their juices into the wine and uh, you're steaming them in wine and then you you dump the pasta in and that that's it. But every time I go to a restaurant, they like they dump the clams out of a can or out of some container and they've already been cooked. God knows how long ago and they're chewy, you know, and uh, they're briny and salty and yeah. You know, and uh, it's it's very easy to do. But for a restaurant to do that, they need somebody standing there because sure. you can't overcook those clams. You know, you walk mm -hmm. away one minute. It's gone. The, the dish is ruined. Mm -hmm. So um, I like, you know, simple dishes like that. There was one I, I got home one day and this is when the first Iraq war took place. And uh, I turned on the TV and uh, the then president Bush, uh, first president Bush, I was on announcing about uh, he was invaded uh, Iraq. And um, so I uh, uh, said, oh, enough of this. I flipped on a uh, cooking channel and they had this recipe that I make, I make and everybody tells me it's the best thing they've ever eaten. And it's ridiculously simple. It's a bunch of seafood steamed in white wine, garlic, a little olive oil. You put clams in. You let the clams partially open, you put mussels in, you let them partially open, you throw shrimp in, you throw anything seafoody you want in there. 
and uh, you dump a ladle full of tomato in, you put the cover on, you come back five minutes later, you throw that over fresh pasta, and it's like the best thing in the world. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's just for whatever reason, the flavors all meld together. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's my favorite thing to cook and when I make it for people. That sounds great. And you said that that's got a lot of positive reaction from people who are reading your blog too, right? So yes. are, are there other dishes that have resonated with a lot of your readers? Uh, risotto. Mm -hmm. um, somehow people think it's some, it's the most difficult thing in the world to make. And it's actually very simple. And there's some shortcuts I put in that, you know, you can, you can cut the time way down. Uh, it's the kind of thing you got to stand by the, by the stove in the old days and just, and just add chicken broth to rice as it gets absorbed by the rice. Yep. Um, you could do that. And I do that all the time, but if people are in a rush, there, there are quicker ways to do it. But come out to me, not all that different. Um, and uh, those are popular. Um, other staples like polenta, which mm -hmm. is grits, mm -hmm. uh, basically the, Ital the Italian version of grits. Uh, it's cornmeal. Uh, very good. Uh, you serve things on top of it or use it as a side dish with cheese blended in. Uh, that's been popular. What's not been popular is when I go off the beaten track and uh, I did one on paella. Okay. I thought I love Spanish food. I, I spent some time in Spain when, when I was young and I love Spanish food. It's the same, very much the similar mm -hmm. techniques, similar approaches to foods, you know, fresh ingredients, all this is Italian, but different. You know, and I, I did paella, I think three people were at it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to make a comparison between, hey, you know, we have risotto, they have paella. Mm -hmm. This is just a different thing. And people mm -hmm. look at it and they, uh, I'm working on one <laughs> right now that's scaring me. Um, oh, yeah? yeah, it's uh, an Italian staple at the holidays. Uh, but I, I'm just worried about the reaction it's going to get rabbit oh okay yeah most of the world eats rabbit mm -hmm. i mean canada eats something like the average canadian eats something like 15 pounds of rabbit a year we we eat like 0. 0.001 <laughs> <you know? laughs> spread out among all americans and it's very good it's extremely healthy mm -hmm. tastes like chicken but has no fat to it um and there's some wonderful preparations of it but um every time well whole Whole food foods a, a year or two ago was protested because they were they were selling rabbits, you know, cut up okay. rabbit and little packets and things. People protested. They weren't protesting the turkey, <laughs> you know, yeah. or the pig. They're protesting the bunny. Right. You know. So I'm I'm kind of afraid to put that out there, but there are so many great things you can do with it. Sure. Well, and uh, <laughs> yeah, you take my word for it, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll, have to, I'll have to read it when you post it. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose, you know, like, like all techniques and recipes, I suppose someone could substitute a different meat if they wanted to, uh, could, but, yeah. you know, but chicken, I think chicken would be the, the likely, uh, candidate for that. Sure. Many of the recipes are the same as rabbit cacciatore and chicken cacciatore right. and things, but, the, but actually it used to be rabbit cacciatore because it, it means hunter's stew and you wouldn't hunt oh. a chicken. Yeah, right. <laughs> hunt the rabbit, and that, that so it originally had rabbit in it, and we put uh, we replaced it with chicken. <laughs> so, so Rich, you have two children, both in their teens. Have they been observing you, or the, do they participate at all in your cooking adventures at home? Oh yeah, yeah. My well, my daughter not so much. Um, she doesn't. She's too interested in sports and being a social teenager. Uh, but my son. Uh, does he and his friends have a meal every month and really? he's a senior in high school and they have a meal every month and he uh, uh, they each make something so I'm trying to think of what the last one was oh it came out awesome um, was uh, Mexican meat uh, carne asada oh my god it was I <laughs> steak this steak was so good mm. i go you're gonna put that in a burrito yeah. <laughs> yeah. so he made a bunch of it and uh, we made it together and then uh, um uh he made burritos for his friends but boy it was it was delicious so yeah we try try things and he he likes to try different uh cultures mm -hmm. uh foods he's tried thai and asian so it's kind of fun to do it with him because i explore too as well 
Sure. And I think that's a little, un- to me, it seems a little unusual for someone his age to want to explore different types of food or to do some of the cooking himself. I think that's, that's terrific. It is terrific. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he actually has some friends who are also interested in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, um, it, it's had its success. You know, they're teenagers. They've had their failures. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. they, they, made so, they made pho once and uh, Greg came home and he says, Dad, it was disgusting. It tasted like boiled feet. And it took like 48 hours to make and sit on the stove and everything. And he said it was disgusting. But that's how you learn. You know, we all know we learn through our mistakes. So. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, earlier in the show, we were talking about how what you try to explore in your food blog is not so much a recipe based uh not so much a recipe based recipe for success in the kitchen, but uh, basing on building blocks known as techniques. And you talked about a couple of the simpler techniques that uh, you try to to use. Uh, Are there any things, any techniques that are more difficult that you've had to uh, overcome when you were making a dish? Oh, I've tried French cooking. I love French food. Um, I can't do it. It's uh, it's too too many layers of complexity mm-hmm. and uh, that's what makes it wonderful it's kind of the antithesis i think to italian cooking which is is mostly simple um, so it it for a, once you got the techniques of italian down it's almost hard to wreck a meal okay it's really easy just grab julia child's book and just pick three recipes in it and it, it's like lab science i mean it's incredible the the history and the knowledge of how all these flavors have to blend a certain way and things that have to be done a certain way. My, one of my favorite meals, I think it's, I can't pronounce French very well, but it's called coco vin. It's a, mm-hmm. um, it's a stewed chicken with all kinds of ingredients. It's wonderful if you have it done right. And it takes hours and hours to just prepare and cook and let it sit on the stove. It's, it's always been a failure. Okay. Always been. And they have all these shortcut things on the internet you go to. They don't work. They don't. <laughs> you got to do it the real way if you want it to be the real thing. Yep. So. so in the short amount of time we have left, Rich, if we were to plan a future video edition of Middlesex Moments and we did a cooking show, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Try, now, I know half hour is kind of tough. We might have to compress time a little bit. But uh, if you had to pick one recipe... To, to bring for a Middlesex Moment show, what would you make for us? Well, I would do that seafood. That only would takes, you? Okay. I think it stews on the stove for maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so that that's pretty easy. Risotto takes about 25, so that wouldn't work for this. Uh, but yeah, we could we could definitely do that. But as long as, you know, I'll have the, the pasta already prepared mm-hmm. and, uh, and ready to go. And uh, we could do that. Okay. Well, I think it sounds good, and we should definitely do that. Although, I don't eat seafood, so we'll have to have someone else be the taste tester. You don't eat seafood? Well, maybe we could come up with something, Steve. We'll put our heads together and come up with right. something. Okay. Well, we, just more for the uh, the crew than, you know, if I don't, uh, if I take a pass on my uh, portion, we can you send do it right? to the crew. Uh, I've never had it, but, uh, I, you know, for the record, I'll be willing to try it. It really would be. <laughs> All right, Steve. Well, thanks for having me. Well, thanks, Rich, for joining us. Rich Lenosi, professor and director of the Center for New Media at Middlesex Community College, food blogger and chef. Uh, and thank you for sharing your tips and uh, recipes with us, Rich. And I'd like to thank all of our listeners and viewers for joining us for another edition of Middlesex Moments. As always, you're welcome to visit us in person. And if you do so, remember to wear a face mask. Uh, Our main campus is located at 100 Training Hill Road in Middletown. You can also see us at our Meriden Center at Platt High School, where we have classes four nights a week. And, of course, you can visit us online 24-7 at mxcc.edu. For everybody at Middlesex Community College, I'm Steve Minkler. Please be safe and be well. (music) 